Hey guys, today we have got a little bit of a different one. Um, this is actually a friend of mine coming on today and he is a medic. Um, he runs a really, really interesting page called Don't Ever Forget Glucose. Uh, and they do medical mnemonics uh, and it's a very, very kind of educational page. Uh, but between the two of us, we're going to talk about a couple of different topics today. Uh, things which are um, a little bit current. Uh, and a couple of things which um, uh, I think just need to see. Uh, so hopefully you guys can see the title up there so you know a bit about what's coming on. Uh, this one's come around. <laughs> How are you doing? Yeah, good. good. How about yourself? Yeah, good. So I've been looking forward to this all day, man. I think this is going to be uh, a little bit different to what, what I normally have on, uh, for sure. Um, yeah. I think a lot of the stuff we're going to talk about is uh, very, very uh, in interesting and useful information. Okay, I've got my face in there now. Perfect. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I was just going to tell the guys, we actually have known each other since we're like five. So this, this, this is like this is like the, the lads having a chat. Uh, <laughs> Iman, I've not been dreading it, don't worry. <laughs> Um, yeah, so obviously a lot of the guys that haven't seen your face before and uh, don't ever forget glucose, uh, and obviously the dentistry page, uh, not many people obviously know who you are. So if you just run through kind of a bit about you, uh, so everyone's a bit up to speed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. So obviously, you know, Jabir, I've known Jabir since I was like a young kid. Uh, went to school together, um, went to the same school. He left for a couple of years and then came back. Um, One year. One year. And then... Um, <laughs> We obviously I went to we went separate ways. So he went studied medicine, uh, dentistry, uh, and I went to go study uh, medicine. So I went to Imperial College, um, and you know it's a six year course there. Um, and after six years, became a doctor. Uh, did my foundation training in the uh, the Northeast Thames Deanery in London, uh, yeah. which is you know quite a good um, it's quite a good uh, teaching area uh, for uh, your foundation year, which is really good. Um, and then I've actually taken a year out of medicine, um, where I've moved back home, uh, and I started my own business. Um, and so I'm looking to go back into training this August. Um, but actually in the final year of med school and kind of how kind of on this conversation today with Jabir as well, um, a few of my housemates were revising for finals. Um, and we were sitting around thinking, look, we spend so much time on Instagram, just procrastinating, mm. uh, you know, looking at stupid videos, looking at stupid memes. And we thought, you know, how wouldn't it be good if, you know, whilst you're on Instagram, if there was like every now and again, somebody just posting something quite useful for an educational, from a medic's point of view. Um, yeah. Exactly. So kind of a bit like subliminal learning. So, you know, you're on Instagram anyway, you're looking at your mates, Instagram, whatever, you're having a bit of a laugh. But actually, as you're flicking through, wouldn't it be good if somebody was just posting a little, you know, a medical like mnemonic or a short little quick fire tutorial where you could learn something. Um, and actually we recreated the page. We thought, you know, this would be perfect. Um, it's slightly different to other pages because our aim is mainly kind of really small, short, quick fire knowledge tips that we can use um, yeah. that you can kind of absorb quickly. Um, and that's kind of how we started the page. And the name, don't ever forget glucose, I mean, I'm not sure if any people, you know, any of your followers went to Imperial, but there's a famous professor that we have whose favorite mnemonic was, and don't ever forget glucose. So that's kind of how we came up with the name as well. Mm. Um, so essentially, you know, that's the story of kind of how we came back with it's our pain. Yeah. And, and to be honest with you, it's not like a, a money making exercise or anything like that. It's purely just an educational page for other medics. Uh, it's not only just for medics, you know, doctors, physios, we have a lot of nurses. You There's know, a lot of crossover with the dentistry as well. Um, exactly, you know, yeah. So a lot of crossover. The facial nerve one as well, which is pretty good. Pretty good. Exactly, um, yeah. So not even just medics as well, you know, even dentists, etc. cetera. Um, and I think the main take home point for us is, you know, we've all been passionate about education, but how can you, in today's 21st century society, try and educate people, especially medics, without being forceful, without being really boring and dull lectures. And actually something that, you know, while you're just messing on your phone, you know, if people are on Instagram all the time on the bus, you know, sitting on the toilet, you know, anything like that, how can you quickly just learn a fact that you probably wouldn't have learned before? Yeah. Um, so that's kind of how the page came about as well. So, and yeah, we've got really good reviews from it. You know, people, we always check our insights. People are always sending it to other people. We get lots of messages, you know, saying thank you. So useful for finals. 
Um, and, I, and it's just something that, you know, we've become a bit passionate about as well. So it's been, it's been quite a good journey. Yeah, and it's kind of interesting because we, we're both quite active on social media, obviously, uh, with my couple of pages and that whole idea of kind of helping people learn. Um, you guys have not already seen it, Deciduous in the comments, and I'm part of Deciduous, and that's literally, uh, we've, we've literally gone through every single uni in the UK, uh, mm. and we've kind of been doing mock finals for everyone. So it's the same sort of thing. We're, we're thinking, how can we use kind of social media um, to kind of help and help and better people and, you know, give everyone a leg up, which is the way I think it should be. Uh, a lot of the time, that's not always the, uh, the case. So you can find a good side of social media, but we also have that kind of negative side as well, um, mm. which I think we were going to talk about a bit later. Um, but there's so many kind of uh, important and really good ways you can use social media to kind of give yourself a leg up. Def mm -hmm. G is one of the, the really good kind of uh, accounts, which is going to help people out. Uh, mm -hmm. So, yeah, you, you definitely guys want to check that out. Um, but we, we both kind of wanted to talk a little bit about the the negative impact of social media as well, because it's it's something that's really prevalent in this kind of day and age with everyone mm -hmm. being sat home uh, with coronavirus and things like that. There's a lot of people scrolling through, you know, endless feeds and just comparing yourselves to another people, another person and thinking, I wish my life was like that. And then, you know, that leads on to a whole other kind of level of almost a, a cycle of depression sometimes. Yeah, so look, I definitely agree. Look, so obviously, you know, we talked a little bit about, um, you know, how social media can be used for good. Um, and I would actually say that most people would, you know, would hope that social media has benefit. And I think it does. So, for example, if you look mm -hmm. at the protests going on at the moment, you know, not just in America anymore, but all over the world. Yeah. The reason why it spread so quickly is because of social media, not just Instagram, you know, Facebook, Twitter, but all these things, you know, information can spread so quickly um, that it can actually, you know, it can be really beneficial, especially for a movement like that. Um, and the same for us, you know, we can spread lots of good information, positive information, you know, spread, you know, good things. The mm. dark side of social media though, is of course that people, you know, tend to portray their life through a rose tinted glass. You know, they talk about, they'll, they'll always post, you know, the best of their life and never kind of the low moments. Mm. And the problem with that is, and, and I might go a little bit medical here, is that it can lead, well, it's shown, evidence has shown that if you're always comparing yourself to other people, it can lead to like increased levels of unhappiness. Yeah. And we're seeing that in society already. You know, you'll find that, you know, levels of depression in the younger population, younger generation is a lot higher than it used to be. Um, and so, you know, suicide rates, you know, are all time high in certain areas. Uh, and one of the most kind of attributable factors that you could suggest here is that everyone, we kind of live in a consumerism in, you know, society where everyone's comparing themselves to everybody else. Mm. Um, and so essentially, you know, it, it can have a negative impact as well. Um, yeah. And so it's really important that, you know, as kind of medical professionals that we're aware of this as well, because this is what you know, the clients, you know, the patients are will be treating in the future. And so if we're kind of out of touch with technology and then we don't understand, you know, what's going on in society, yeah. you know, we're letting our, our patients down. Um, so I think it's really important for us just to be aware of this kind of thing and then think about what we can do to improve that as well. Yeah, it's interesting you bring that up because I was reading not so long ago, you know, when it was Mental Health and Awareness Week, um, mm. there were a couple of papers that kind of came to my attention where um, they were talking about gratitude as a, as a method mm -hmm. of actual treatment for mm -hmm. depression and self-help. Um, and what they found was people who kind of were put on a a regime almost a regime of saying i'm happy about this i'm happy about that i'm grateful for this i'm grateful for that versus like a control there was a significant increase in how they perceived their life and how they perceived their self-worth uh all those kinds of things and that, that was quite interesting because it almost ties into what you were saying about comparing yourself to other people mm -hmm. when you actually start to stop doing that and you you think about what you have you know, within your own life that's going well. Um, it could be something really small, but it just builds you, builds you up mm. very, very slowly. Um, and then you can kind of come out of that horrible cycle of depression if you're in that. Or if you're just normal, you know, you're not depressed, but you're not happy either. You can move up a level, you know, into kind of a more positive mindset. Mm. Well, look, it's, I think you've raised a good point there. And also, 
Um, I'm not sure if you know about this, but they did a study on lottery winners. Um, and what they found was that when they, when somebody, for example, wins the lottery, you know, you'd expect them to be happy forever. You know, mm. that's kind of how, how you expect it to go. But actually what happens is that when someone wins the lottery, they do have a big spike in happiness um, but then actually it kind of mellows out and they find this new baseline that they now travel at of this is their new level of happiness. Yeah. So now if they want to again have that same height of happiness, they've got to do something even more kind of ridiculous or, you know, buy something even more expensive. And so it ultimately will always be a zero sum game, as in you will always be chasing a never ending dream. Um, and so effectively things like Instagram, you know, where you see people living this lavish lifestyle, you'll always be, chasing it um, and yeah. there'll always be somebody with a you know a nicer car nicer this nicer that and so effectively if you are in that kind of mindset and that cycle of comparing yourself it's something that you'd ultimately need to break out of and I, and I know lots of people take um social media detoxes um if you want to call it that where they just go yeah. off social media for a month uh, and people find it you know they become in close to their friends they keep in touch with their family a lot more they speak to people a lot more, which no people don't tend to do anymore. And all that's shown, you know, to, to improve your levels of happiness uh, and form your deeper connections and bonds to people. So, you know, look, again, I am a big advocate for social media as well, because I think there's lots of benefits for it. But I do think yeah. it's important to be careful with, with the use of social media, particularly stuff like Instagram, um, just because of the nature of, you know, portraying your life in a certain light. Um, mm. yeah I, I spoke to someone about this recently uh i don't think it was on a live or anything but it was like um so, someone messaged me going oh are you on holiday right now i'm like no i just take lots of photos when i'm on holiday um <laughs> like the, the, the whole point of my instagram is not to show you what i'm doing it's mm. kind of a personal um art calendar almost like of, of just interesting things that i've done or like i tried to do a cool photograph with throwing a camera up in the air and catching it it's just random stuff that I decide to do. It's not because, you know, I'm trying to make some sort of statement or anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes you don't need to look at that because a lot of the time, you, you know, you went on holiday with me. We took multiple photographs on the same day. Um, yeah. I'm just, just walking down the street, man. Um, it doesn't mean that I did anything special. It's just I went on the same holiday that a thousand other people went on the same day. Mm -hmm. And we just took a photograph. But what does that make me any better than anyone else? It doesn't. Mm -hmm. I think people kind of just need to almost almost like re recognize that really obviously, like just because a guy has taken a photograph or a girl's taken a photograph in a certain way, it doesn't make you any less of a, you know, a successful person mm. or anything like that. Uh, and it comes back to what you were talking about earlier about that internal versus external locus of where you find your self-worth. When you mm. find it from within yourself, you'll pretty much ride all the bumps when you're looking for that appreciation and love from other people you're always going to find huge ups and huge downs you know when you do something really impressive then everyone's going oh well done oh great great oh i can't believe you're so sick and stuff like that and then you know if you do something which is not so great and people start getting on your back that's going to affect you mm -hmm. in such a massive way um so I, I think that's something that you've kind of got to find a way to kind of have a, a stable a stable mm -hmm. kind of set way of just looking at yourself yeah well look people will never post on instagram in particular you know the lowest moments of their life mm. um you know you'll, you'll hardly ever see somebody say you know actually you know, this went terribly for me i had a terrible day uh feeling quite low because it doesn't get the likes and you know people are quite like dependent um and so that's one of the reasons why they're like a perpetual cycle of, you know, posting your best life. And that's what people say, you know, living my best life. Um, yeah. So, you know, that's obviously uh, one of the reasons why another cool, you know, interesting thing, you know, whilst, you know, we are both you know, medical is they did like a study on young children. And, they would, and this is true that when they would be looking on social media, they'd be fire. They'd be like having a similar effect of a dopamine release, which is like mm -hmm. a drug addict. Uh, would have with the you know when they take their drug of choice so it's similar to you know and I'm the same you know I will always be grabbing my phone checking it every kind of half an hour even though nothing's happened um, yeah, it almost you don't, becomes you don't an addiction see me. <laughs> <laughs> you don't see me with my phone on a day so you know, it, all, it almost becomes an addiction and also you the addiction lies in you know how many likes can I get how many views can I get and mm. you you kind of base your self-worth on that as well so 
those are really simple traps. Just you don't have to do anything, but just be aware of, you know, am I feeling a certain way because of this? Or actually, you know, should I? Sh and I think the first step is just being aware. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm not saying necessarily not everyone get off Instagram right now. You know, like I said no, before, no, no. do you think we need more people on Instagram and specifically on this live? So, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I mean, I think it's a lot to do with like how you use it and what you're using yeah, it for, for sure. as well. Um, and I think one of the good things I want to talk to you about today as well was um, the use of Instagram, in particular for dentists, is a lot more valuable um, from, you know, for a dental practice and for a particular dentist than for a doctor. Um, I just want yeah. to go, tell me a little yeah. bit more about kind of how that's come about and what's the use of it as well. Yeah, well, hold on, I'm just going to turn the light off because it's shining in my eyes. One second. <laughs> no worries better yeah much better um yeah the the main the main kind of way that i see it is because we are a very visual profession especially with cosmetic dentists you don't really have the same sort of thing within medicine generally you have your aesthetic medics you know um you know who are going to do some facial facial aesthetics stuff like that but dentists are doing that as well and then you've got the obvious kind of you know uh, plastic surgery surgical rhinoplasty and stuff like that which probably does tie in um but with dentistry it's so it's so obviously the first thing you see uh just the famous photograph of the guy missing an, an eyebrow and missing mm. a front tooth and you know all of the bits and pieces go not quite right with uh how he's looking or not quite normal if you want to call it like that but um the first thing you notice is the tooth um so it, it's a very very visual um kind of profession um so i think mm -hmm when you can see a before and an after it's a wow factor and it's a shareable thing so obviously that's how social media works the more the more wow factor something is the more it gets shared the more kind of um of a ball rolling effect there is and the bigger people kind of get and you can see like people like um dr michael apper and you know he's very very well now known kind of most people will know who he is um and there's not so much the same thing with medicine. You do have, again, Dr. Mike, mm. but I think that's just because he's an especially good looking guy. Um, <laughs> <a> dog. <laughs> no, I, think um, so, I think one thing that you've said there um, uh, is obviously, you know, it's quite visual, which I agree with. <clears throat> the other thing I would say, though, is that um, I think dentists tend to use it more because dentistry is kind of 50 percent you know nhs but also percent private so it is almost like a business as well yeah, so it's the same yeah, way yeah, that cool. you know that you know, somebody else would be advertising any other business you know that people do you know on instagram mm. so i think that's kind of another point of why you don't see as many doctors you know becoming a individual brand per se but i do think that you know a lot of doctors should be doing that particularly, you know, if you are interested in a certain field, because I think it does give you that edge. And also, like, for example, you know, I'm interested in, in a medical education. Mm. I could probably, you know, release a mnemonic and get more than 10,000 people, you know, teach 10,000 people that I never had the chance to teach before, as opposed to doing something traditional like holding a class. So I yeah. think, you know, even even that can have a great impact. It doesn't have to necessarily be just that that business aspect yeah here. it's it's interesting you say that we have something called kind of referral networks within dentistry so mm -hmm. um for myself i i want to do root canal work as, as a specialty which you obviously already know um once i become a uh, a specialist i'm going to want people to send me some patients so then you do want to be known because uh, you're going to be working most likely on a private basis so it's not like you can go out and be like, oh, uh, to the Joe public, oh, do you want a root canal? Everyone's going to say, bro, get lost. I don't want a root canal. No one wants <laughs> one. But sometimes there are cases which are difficult. You need to know other dentists and you need to know, kind of get your name out that way. Um, and that's something that I've actually been working on. Uh, if anyone saw the earlier IGT video I did, um, mm -hmm. it was a really interesting kind of thought process that I've gone through because I've done this for a long time, you know, two and a half years. And you know more than kind of most people know me personally how long it takes out of my day and kind of stuff like that so i thought we wanted to kind of take things to the next level and have some sort of a community behind it because within dentistry you can be kind of isolated you know you're in a room with a nurse and that could be the only person that you see regularly on a day-to-day -day basis and that can be quite quite downheartening for some people 
um, you know, because you're used to a dental school and there's people everywhere. Um, so what I've done is tried to create a community around things. Um, so we're taking that to the next level. There's going to be like a, a private chat room, stuff like that, but also a private referral network across the world. So if, for example, I know you, uh, you've gone to LA and you broke your front tooth and your mm. photos are ruined. I can then, I can then, you know, refer you to someone that I know out there, uh, mm. within the referral network that I'm building. I say, actually, Sean, you can see this person. We'll sort you in about five minutes, 10 minutes, you know. Um, mm. He'll make space for you and get your teeth sorted. If something needs to be done when you get home, then we'll do that as well. But at least your photos aren't going to be ruined. Uh, so that's something that we're building on what's called the Patreon. If someone's, you know, if you guys are interested in that, then have a little look. It's uh, quite interesting kind of uh, a way to do things. So hopefully um, that's something that's going to take off. Um, but you're right. The, it's the whole idea of being able to reach people so there's a bunch of people watching us now who are learning things that you know we'd never be able to speak to these guys normally so it's really interesting how things can take on another level um and it's quite yeah. it's quite uh, uplifting in a way yeah so just kind of moving on from that so obviously you know i've spoken to you a lot you know outside of this a lot you know about the industry etc but just for everyone listening particularly uh, medics that might have tuned in what is the general consensus among dentists of, you know, the current ethos, the current feeling in dentistry among dentists uh, in terms of the work, the work-life balance, the pay, all this kind of stuff? And I'll tell you the equivalent in medicine afterwards as well. Oh, well are we doing medicine versus dentistry thing? <laughs> we'll, we'll, do, <laughs> we'll do a little bit back and forth. It's a bit of flame wars, man. <laughs> <laughs> Not um, quite. I think I'll, I think I'll be quite honest about it as well. Yeah, uh, no, no. We're, 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 it's very much dependent on where you work in uh whether you're working you know for example in the states things are settled very nicely over there or you whether you're working in the uk in the nhs and then versus private so there's there's kind of a whole host of situations which you could be working in uh but i would say if you are a dentist who's doing well in the uk um and you move into private practice you're going to be doing very nicely for yourself and really you shouldn't be kind of unless you've got ridiculously expensive tastes you shouldn't be kind of struggling at any any point um unless you, i'm just getting <laughs> trolled here man um so yeah dentistry is a very comfortable lifestyle and kind of one of the reasons that i picked it myself it gives you that nine to five work-life balance even less if you're if you really want and you can also do a surgical kind of profession it, it you can do surgery you can do all these things mm -hmm. Or you can do education, you can do lecturing, um, or you can do, you know, community work. You could go to, you know, more disadvantaged areas and work there as well. So there's such an, a wide variety of work that you can be getting on and doing um, mm. that you can find kind of a, a niche for yourself uh, with with whatever you want to be doing. Obviously, if you're going to chase the money, which is never a good idea, unless you're actually interested in the kind of work that you can do that as well. And you can do very well for yourself. Mm. No, I think, I think that's quite a fair, uh, a fair summary of it. Um, I think you were telling me last time, you know, there was some people in dentistry feeling as though that it's going a bit pear shaped, you know, there's people mm. a bit of a negative atmosphere around it as well. Talk to me a little bit about that as well. Um, I think this is probably UK specific to be honest. Mm. I, I think elsewhere people are loving it um covid you know kind of exception exceptionally um you know take that out of the kind of equation because that's kind of ruined everyone's uh, enjoyment of everything anywhere so um i think in the uk we have an up-and-coming young generation of very very enthusiastic dentists uh, and then above that we have um a more middle-aged and, and not so happy to see kind of younger people succeed and overtake them in such a quick manner which is happening with social media mm. so that's something that i think some people are struggling against so there are guys out there uh close friends of mine who finished you know 10 years uh, less than 10 years ago who are now mm. you know 30,000 followings 40,000 followings doing very well with social media and stuff like that treating celebrities you know all that kind of thing that normally in the past would have been the guy who's 60 further down the line, he, yeah. he would be doing that work because he's um, <clears throat> known as the, the really good guy. So I think there's been a lot of a struggle that way. Mm. And then when you go into these Facebook groups of, you know, 
everyone's in there. Um, it can be quite nasty at times. So what we've done, uh, Hass is uh, there, Beard and Tooth Fairy, he's, he's created along with a few of others, uh, something called Deciduous. So we kind of said anyone past 2016 who's graduated, join this group, we'll help each other and we'll lift each other up and we'll teach, you know, whatever needs to be said. And so there has been a way around it. So uh, I think that kind of sums up how it is, but I think that's probably the same within any profession, with any group of people. There's people who are doing a bit better than other people. Other people are jealous, all that mm. kind of thing goes on. Yeah, I suppose that's not really dead specific. I think you'd find no. that in any career that you'd go in, particularly, like you said, social media. I think that's uh, what's and, driving. Yeah. And I, and I think honestly, like that's, I hate to say it, but like a circle of life, like, you know, if the old generation hasn't moved on with social media and, you know, they're missing a trick, well, you know, unfortunately they'll be left behind, which isn't great for them, but no. that's just the way things work sometimes. Um, so what I will do for you is give you the, the medicine equivalent, which is Let's go slightly it. different. Again, unfortunately, no, I can only speak on the UK, um, well, yeah, the UK system and the yeah. NHS. Um, so, I mean, every year the GMC does a study uh, on certain things, um, particularly the junior doctors and the working environments and whether we're happy, you know, or unhappy. And it's quite interesting. So this tells a lot about the profession. So they found that like, kind of majority of the, the doctors in particular were feeling quite undervalued, um, which was one of the reasons for unhappiness levels. Uh, and they found that a lot of the doctors, so after your foundation years, you have the choice of going to specialty training. I probably explain that to all the all the dentists who don't know yeah. quite how it works. So you do your five or six years of med school, you do foundation years, which is usually two years, um, and then you can choose to specialise. You know whether you want to be a surgeon, whether you want to be a medic, which kind of means stuff like you know diabetes, renal, you know, lung, all that kind of thing. Yeah. Or if you want to do something a bit more specialised, such as paediatrics, you know, gynaecology, obstetrics, all that kind of thing. So they've found that a lot of doctors now, the majority, in fact, after their foundation years, are not going into specialised training, like taking a year out. And it's because yeah. a lot of them are becoming burnt out. Um, and I can give you my own personal experience from medicine. I can't speak on behalf of the, you know, the profession the as a profession, whole. Yeah. Um, but you know, I, my, I, for one, have also taken, we call it an F3, a gap year, essentially. Mine wasn't necessarily because I was burnt out, but because I wanted to explore new things. But I think that ties in with, with medicine as well, because unlike dentistry, I would say it's more life-consuming. Um, and the reason being is because you know, we do nights, weekends, you know, on-course shifts. It can be quite stressful, um, and it is... I don't want to obviously play down dentistry because obviously you do lots of valuable work, but it no. can also be quite high pressure situations as well. It's um, different. Yeah. It's a very different area. It's kind of experience. Exactly. Exactly. And certain errors, you know, can, you know, they can outfold and have higher consequences, shall we say. So it can be slightly more high pressure. It can be longer working hours. Um, and then I suppose one of the values, one of the reasons why you can also feel undervalued is because you are a public servant. Um, so you might not get some of the perks that you'd see people of a similar age to you, similar education to you getting mm. uh, in life. Um, however, on the flip side of that is the complete aspect of, you know, the the fact that in medicine you have very rare thing, which you know, I'm not taking away from dentists because they do something quite similar anyway. And, and I'll talk to you a little bit about kind of my own opinion on dentistry as well next, is they have the, you know, the very rare thing of having to help people as their job. And having the chance to actually, you know, and as much as the cliche, save people's lives, mm. uh, which all junior doctors will do at one point or the other, you know, whether you're on call shift or, you know, you've seen an emergency patient or a cardiac arrest, you will, you will inevitably do that. So it is kind of a very precious job in that sense as well. Um, another thing I would say as well is that this is the kind of the views of the junior doctors. And so my sister, who's a bit senior than me, uh, says that as you get higher up, things uh, improve. Um, a lot more yeah um, and so in terms of stress wise she says that like, you've got more responsibility but in terms of kind of being comfortable with your job you know feeling kind of like job satisfaction it improves a lot more um, and is, you have and you have a lot more autonomy yeah as well. for it. I no it's made you have a lot more autonomy as well yeah uh, I, I just wondered because you do med school and you have to learn such a wide breadth you probably go don't go into so much depth on each subject is that where that comfort level comes up when you actually kind of 
go okay this is now my area and you kind of learn more around just that area and mm -hmm. then so you've seen things hundreds of times by you know a couple of years in and it doesn't phase you as much um i wouldn't say it's probably the fact that you feel out of your depth i think you've spoke to all junior doctors from the days of med school to when you become a doctor there is a step up um yeah and, it be, and the reason being is quite similar to you know being a learner driver or reading a theory book and then having mm. to go drive a car by yourself and nobody watching you. And that's the best way to describe it. Like, you know, kind of what you're doing, you know, the basics, you know how to be safe. Mm. Um, but it is kind of a lot to do with just being, um, being kind of comfortable in your own. And it's kind of a confidence thing. And, and you, and we, you, you do become more confident, you know, as you go along with it. Yeah. Um, I don't think that's one of the main reasons why um, that yet yeah, you feel kind of satisfaction level not as high, but I, it's one, it is one of the things I guess that you could talk mm. about. Um, uh, do medics learn the mouth in one day? To be honest with you, we actually don't really learn much about you know oral medicine at all. Um, I think it's probably the reason why max fact surgeons have to do another degree in dentistry. Yeah. Um, just because you know when our actual dental knowledge is obviously pretty poor. Even mm. though when you know, if somebody came to A and E with like a bleeding tooth out of hours, you know, dentists might not see them. We'd be the one <laughs> putting in the you know packaging and that kind of thing to stop the bleeding. <laughs> Which I have done before, by the way. <laughs> did you call one did you call me or Amma? I think that's that's probably the uh It's not a night shift. It's not a night shift and they were on warfarin um and put all the packing on and wait until the morning and then they were <laughs> stopped bleeding eventually. It took bloody yeah. ages. <laughs> Um, Iman's asking, she's always got questions, Iman. Um, in terms of the most stressful job, I think they are both stressful, but the mm -hmm. stresses come in different areas. Within dentistry, uh, there's a, certainly a feeling between um, kind of younger dentists that we don't get enough exposure to treatments. Uh, for example, I had done three fillings in university full stop on a live patient. Whereas I'd done almost 15 root canals, probably why I enjoy doing them because I, I feel much more comfortable there. But obviously, as soon as you come out, you're doing lots and lots of everything. Mm -hmm. um, and that can be stressful because actually you've come out and you, you know the theory of what you're doing. And there's you know a lot of theory, but you, you're kind of on top of that. But physically mm -hmm. doing something. Yeah, I know it's crazy that I don't even three, but it's just kind of how things felt. But um, in theory, you know, think physically, you just know, okay, this is what I'm supposed to do and this is what it's supposed to look like, how it's supposed to feel. Um, mm. It's just one of those things that's a bit, uh, you know, like daunting. You come out and you technically know how to do everything, but you've not done it lots of times. Mm. And dentistry is something definitely where you need repetition, but now you're, now you're doing it on paying patients because especially in the UK, uh, there are very few patients who, uh, depending on where you work, obviously, uh, are not paying. So there's only, mm. you know, pensioners under 18s mm -hmm. and people on benefits everybody else is paying and they're expecting a top level service no matter who you are mm -hmm. um so i think that's kind of part of the stress mm -hmm. um but yeah i <clears throat> iman just so you know a lot of my patients that i saw were actually really really kind of uh poor oral hygiene so everything had already kind of gone into the pulp so i need quite a lot of root canal work as opposed to filling work which is why but mm -hmm. it meant that i hadn't done those particular things yeah, so look, so from kind of the medicine point of view, whether it's you know as stressful or not, I think I can't speak on all the kind of areas of medicine because so yeah. many different specialties. I'm sure an obstetrician and gynecologist would say it's highly stressful, but the dermatologist would say you know it's the most easy job in the world. So it really varies from specialty to specialty, and you can be. Now, if you want to avoid that stressful lifestyle, you can choose to do that. You can easily choose a you know, nine-to-five dermatology job. Um, mm. It's not easy to get, by the way, because of that reason. All you know, general practice, etc. There are more clinic-based, um, so if that is your thing, or you can, if you do enjoy the high-flying life, you know, you want to be involved in cardiac arrest, you want to be involved in treating, you know, MIs. Then you could be a cardiologist, for example. Uh, yeah. You feel a bit more like a superhero, um, but again, it's more stressful. Um, but I do think certain personality types are naturally drawn to those jobs anyway. Mm. Um, because if you, it's very rare that you'll survive eight years of training, you know, day in, day out. If you're not enjoying what you're doing, you'll want to drop out on the first day uh, no, if you can't sure. handle the stress levels. So people who actually enjoy the stress and want to embrace it tend to do those jobs anyway. Uh, and the people that kind of shy away from it or are not 
I'm not quite passionate about it, we'll end up doing something else, which I guess is the right way of, of it being, I suppose. You don't want people who don't want to do the job in that area. Would we swap places? Would either of you done the other profession? Personally, I mean, probably not, if I'm honest with you. Um, I, only reason I say that, and I'm probably wrong for this, is because I feel as though with medicine, you have slightly more opportunities and opportunity to do different things. Mm. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, Jabir, but you know, I know lots of doctors who are wilderness medicines, medics, so they go on expeditions. I know lots of doctors who are sports doctors. Uh, you know, I know lots of doctors who you know, do wild and wonderful things. Um, you, know, such a, you can have such a wide variety of jobs. You can work three days a week. You can do a PhD. You know, because you have that breadth of knowledge, like you said, of the whole human body, um, you can go into so many different specialties and different interests. Uh, I, I think doctors, there are the options. They're probably not quite as wide ranging as medicine, mm -hmm. but there, there are a number of areas where you can move into. And kind of, you're already seeing kind of what I'm doing, and the, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm just involved in about three or four different things. Which well, basically, uh, with medicine, areas. if you ever come to a point where actually I don't like what I'm doing, you can oh, just pack up your bags and find something else. Mm. Uh, there's never be, there never will be a situation where you're just boxed into that box. So that's one of the best things about it. I know doctors have gone into management consultancy and work in big healthcare firms now, or yeah. Public Health England. Um, so there's so much thing that if you want to make a difference and make an impact, having a degree in medicine is probably one of the best ways to start. And you don't yeah. even have to work with a doctor. Um, that's just my personal opinion, though. I, I would suspect it's similar for, for dentistry because it, you know, it's the same length of degree and it's, it's similar mm -hmm. kind of status. Um, so I, I'm not really sh uh, sure that we have fewer options in that way and you know if we wanted to leave dentistry which quite a lot of people do actually want to leave just haven't maybe got the um the, the balls to almost do it because it's a it's a difficult move you know to, to completely throw away what was you know up to 10 15 years of education and then completely turn into a different direction i think that's quite a, a brave thing to do um but I, th I think there are there are options for the guys out there um, mm. And like Iman says, there are a lot of uh, specialties within dentistry, dentistry. which are very wide yeah. ranging and different. Um, but That's yeah, good. I kind of get what you're saying there. Um, mm. One thing I want to talk to you about, Jabir, actually, uh, I know we've got a bit on our list as well, is um, it's quite, an, it's quite a <laughs> get a degree. That doesn't work, Iman. It, it hasn't worked <laughs> for me anyway. <laughs> so, well, so one thing I want to talk to you about was about, um, do, you know, do you think that dental care in the UK should be free? as with all with the rest of healthcare and if not right. why not <laughs> you, you need to be re, me to be uh controversial as usual i think because <laughs> we, we had this conversation it. before <laughs> um i think it's a very difficult question and there are a lot of um kind of variations and things to think about when you talk about this but mm -hmm. for example i've had the situation where um you speak to a patient every three months about gum disease and you tell them everything. And it's not like you've, you know, got them in and out of the, the, the door and push them through. Um, you give them full advice, everything they need to do. And they come back three months later and it's worse or the same. Nothing's changed mm -hmm. in a system where they had to pay for that advice and really pay like a pay specialist. So someone actually went and saw my cousin. I'm pretty sure they'd seen someone, um within the nhs and my cousin worked privately um but because he's now paying x amount a couple of hundred pounds he's really gone and hammered it and it's made a difference same advice different payment mm. system didn't pay for one paid for the other mm. and now there's been a difference and in that way i'm kind of the opinion i mean it's very harsh that 90 percent of dental treatment should not be free uh, and completely private. I think people who've got syndromes, they should be referred on to secondary care because you can't do anything about. Everything else is almost self-inflicted. I know that's the, the really kind of uh, brutal and blunt way of say, saying it. And there are socioeconomic status things which you can put into it. Um, but I think that's something that people really have to consider because a lot of this stuff is completely and utterly, you know, self-inflicted and, and it does annoy me sometimes. Um, uh, but it is one of those things that it's not an easy question to answer. I don't know if that's answered it well enough for you or not. Yeah. I mean, like one of the comments is, and I probably was, would be my next point. And I'd tell you my interview question that I got 
uh, when I applied for med school was if there was an extreme sports, you know, athlete who did skateboarding every single day mm. uh, and he broke his leg, should you treat him for free? And I suppose your argument essentially, no, you should charge him because then he won't do it. Um, but then do you not think that's the wrong way to go about things? Are we not just, you know? It's, it's such a kind of, it's almost like a bottomless pit and you can go in circles, can't you? Yeah. Well, I agree with you. I mean, I um, some af- some like aspect of me also thinks that you know, by giving everything for free, it undervalues it. Which I think the I point think that's is where I'm coming from. Yeah. Yeah, I think you under- I think if you don't value the treatment, then you don't really care about it, and so you'll just do it again. Which I do agree to with some to some degree, and I think it's proven as well that when you make people pay for something, they value it more. And if you make yeah. people pay a lot for something, like a Louis Vuitton bag, they value it extre- extremely, uh, very highly, don't they? Mm. So. I mean, it's a good point that you're raising. I think I'm of the, the opinion that, you know, NHS is free healthcare is the best thing to ever happen to society. To, you know, to have a really good society, you need to have an element of a safety net for people who can live safely and effectively. Um, but dentistry is not the only people, you know, eye care, for example, uh, mm. isn't free. Uh, hearing, again, not always free. Um, so yeah, just, just drop in there. Alina we'll definitely be uh, kind of addressing those issues. And there are quite a few IGTV videos on my page. If you want to have a look at those that do address that, depending on where you are, we may, may have to make a different video for you. Uh, so yeah, message Iman like she's offering and, and let me know kind of where you're looking to apply and we'll, we'll deal with mm. that. But yeah, I, th- I think that's um, what you're talking about there is, is a really difficult question because I gave the example of someone who's gone to an NHS practice where you pay, if you're a paying patient, 30 odd quid versus mm-hmm. going to see someone who's a private dentist, not even a specialist. You're looking at a couple of hundred quid. So it's a big difference. You're then going to value that advice and level of treatment in such a different way. And mm-hmm. if you know that actually, if you don't get on top of it, you're going to have to pay that every three months because that's kind of the recommended level uh, of when people should come back for that particular treatment. Mm-hmm. That's going to make a big difference to your bank account and to the way of thinking that you're you're coming with. Can I ask you now the, the flip side of that question? Yeah, will obviously be um, is that a approach as a treatment, and is that a bad thing? Um, in what way does it affect the the treatment? So, for example, I won't mention any names, um, but you know, when you speak to certain dentists, I'll often say to you, if somebody comes through my door and I feel as though you know they might be able to sway them into more treatment than usual just because they'll get paid more for it. Surely it's in their interest to do more, over-treat people, overcharge people, and you get paid more. So is that a kind of a bad system to be involved with? Essentially? Or alternatively, if something doesn't pay well, but it's actually good for the patient, you might not do it. I think that's the entire problem with the NHS system. Um, I, I think we probably tried to explain this to guys before. So within the NHS, if you come in and you need one filling and I come in and I need 12, the dentist will get paid the same amount, even though Mm. the time spent might be four or five times the amount spent on me than on you. If you imagine then that means that that dentist has to do much, much quicker treatment. So the value and the quality of the treatment is obviously going to drop because there are overheads and there are kind of other things that need to be paid for nurses, staff, all those kinds of bits and pieces. And like mm-hmm. Iman saying, that is a lot of the reasons why people sit in the UK do go private. We kind of see, you end up seeing much fewer patients and earn the same as you would be on the NHS, but you kind of got that inner satisfaction knowing that you did the absolute best for every bit of treatment you did because you were able is to- Is that entirely that true? Or would you say that they will then, because it's private, they will start to over-investigate, over-treat, overcharge? I think not because we're quite heavily regulated. I think there are places in the world that that probably does go on. Uh, Mm. But within the UK, you know, you have to have a justification, certainly in the States as well, uh, you know, and all the kind of Western nations in the US. And I I would think, you know, up and coming places like Dubai and the Middle East, they're they're in a similar sort of situation where there's got to be a good uh, rationale behind things um, that you kind of aren't able to do more than would need to be done. It mm. then comes because, because you can easily have a comeback and be sued. And that happens mm. quite a lot. 
Um, That's another thing I was going to go on to. So is there quite a litigation culture in dentistry because it's private, effectively, because you're paying for something? Uh, not yeah, not even even if they're they're getting it for free in the UK, people come at you. So mm. I can't go into details. Someone sent a letter to my practice in the last week about something that I've done. I've gone back through it. I have no idea what they're complaining about because from what I've done and what the previous dents have done, nothing seems out of the ordinary, but people try it on. And that's one of the problems with kind of the no win, no fee thing. Um mm. so I, I think it is difficult to do the over treatment side of things. I think in the past it was a huge problem, for sure. Mm. Definitely a huge problem. Uh, I'm not sure it's as much of an issue now. I think under treatment is on the NHS is now more of an issue. Yeah, well, look, I'm just trying to compare it to medicine. So I'm not sure if you read in the news recently, but there was a surgeon in, I think it was Birmingham or Manchester, one of those, but it was a shoulder surgeon. He was in the news. Mm. Um, and he was sued recently because he had been privately performing lots of extra procedures and surgeries then that was actually required for those patients. And obviously he was getting paid for each one. So for example, if he had the opportunity where he could do something non-invasively, he would choose the invasive option because he'd get paid more for it. And that right. obviously is an ethical, it's a bit of a gray area because obviously he could always argue that, you know, I'm a specialist in this field. I know what to do. I can have a better look by doing this, this and this and quite possibly be right. But and after investigation, it was found out that actually he was over, over treating okay. people. Yeah possibly didn't necessarily need surgery there um and so that is kind of you know someone's always kind of spotted uh, what we're talking Violet. about well, so. Yeah. yeah so it was i think it was a spy hospital but um in that scenario it's kind of it, it kind of runs parallel with dentistry i was thinking you know because you're paying for something there might be some rogue dentist who then think you know hang on i could probably get away with doing a little bit extra here making extra I, I bet there are I bet there are, mm -hmm. but I think the thing that's probably very, very weird is mm -hmm. the guys who are doing that are charmers and the patients love them. So they're either doing mm -hmm. too much, but the patient loves them. So they're like, oh, he can do no wrong. Oh, he was so mm -hmm. lovely though. But they, <laughs> patients don't, in dentistry especially, uh, judge the quality of the dentist by the quality of the work. Mm -hmm. They judge it by the manner. So I could be doing the absolute best work neat seen on the planet but mm -hmm. if i'm a bit of a, a prick to the patient he's probably going to sue me even if i've done a good job uh on the other hand there could be a guy who's just leaving things you know letting decay go deep um letting you know fillings go where you should be really replace, replacing them not doing gum treatment because it's boring mm -hmm. uh but he's a great talker and the patients love him he, he always asks about the grandkids and stuff like that that guy's mm -hmm. going to get away with it um and that's something that I think you commonly see, uh, mm. really, really commonly see, especially when you take over a practice from a, from a dentist who's a, a bit of a, you know, uh, a talker with the patients. And then now you tell mm. them, actually, you've got loads of stuff that he's doing has been neglected. And they almost don't believe you because they love the other guy so much. I think you know, just to kind of compare it to medicine, one mm. of the reasons why I think it's so good that it's free is that there's never, ever any conflict of interest between no. a doctor and a patient because... For me, if I was then to go and order 10 scans, actually, it's going to cause me to do more work. And I'm not getting paid to do those scans. I'm not going to do it unless I know that's going to be beneficial for the diagnosis. So yeah. even though there might be some, you know, inefficiencies in a public service like medicine, like the NHS, there are some inherent benefits like that. Like you can't get anywhere else by, yeah. because if the doctors aren't incentivized to over-treat and you know, over investigate, it comes to a point where we're trying to be as efficient as possible. There might be some wastage associated with that as well, yeah. um, because you know you're not just um, almost like you said you don't value something as well. On the other side, like you know, for for example, as a dentist, like you know, if you've got um, materials that you have that you've bought, you don't want to just waste it and use too much, but mm. you might want to, you know, just do some of that. So. Whereas for us, there might be some waste. You might think, actually, let's try this scan. It might show us some more information. It's not going to cost us anything. So there's yeah, no harm. It doesn't it. matter to you. It's not going to make you get paid more or get paid less. Yeah. It's just basically, can we um, you know, do something in that scenario? So that's, a, that's one of the benefits that you can get from a public service system like that as well. Do you know what's um, interesting? I think we talked about Instagram, you know, and social media. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's the best thing that's ever happened for dental patients 
because mm -hmm. if you're going to a dentist who posts all his work on social media, he is being meticulous because those photographs need to be spot on. And if somebody mm -hmm. sees something which is a little bit off, they're on you like a flash and you mm -hmm. can't, you know, and they will go for you. So then that's, that means that you're thinking about the work you're doing more in more detail and you're getting things more, you know, you're, you're, you're improving your quality of your work because you know, you're going to get called out if you don't. Uh, right. So there's been a big uplift in the quality. Uh, and that's been something that's kind of, I was speaking to uh, somebody recently and they said, actually, since the whole Instagram thing hit our country, the quality of work has gone through the roof because everybody can see in good, clear detail how good or bad the work is. Mm. So that's kind of the, the another positive side almost, but uh, one that's uh, almost not, not always uh, seen. Yeah, no, I agree. And I mean, I just want to make it really clear, you know, like I'm not against dentists charging money at all. I think it's, you know, it's a system that we're in. I'm happy to, to work in that system. I think like, I think the key point I want to highlight, and I think you agree with this and you said this earlier, is that it's important to be an ethical dentist, right? Yeah, for sure. And, and it's important that you're regulated and, you know, that, that's something that's inevitable, that, you know, the GDC is there. And, and I think the key thing is being, like, I think someone mentioned it earlier, is being an ethical practitioner. That's yeah, most probably a man because she's made most of the comments. <laughs> and also i mean it's good i mean i think people resonate more with an ethical practitioner like, for example even if you are private but you tell them look you know this is what you probably will need this is how i think mm. we should do it i'm not trying to overcharge you somebody could do this this and this but i don't think it's best for you just that honesty probably get yeah. you more clients by doing that as well no i think um, 100%. Um, so, yeah I, th I think we've got another question I think that it's always with all medical professionals, the more report you build, the more trustworthy you seem. 100%, yeah. yeah. I think that makes it. My comments make these lives. <laughs> Iman, you're going to have to just, you know, come on a live one day and, you know, you can just talk for, for 60 minutes and I'll sit here with a tea. <laughs> um, we did want to kind of quickly touch upon something else as well, uh, just because it is in the news and it's something that kind of we both kind of faced, I think, you know, to different levels, obviously not to the level that's going on in America, um, but the whole racism and BLM movement is going on. Uh, and sorry, guys, to change kind of the tone so quickly. Um, but I, th I think we both thought it's something that kind of needed to be raised. Um, because I did a story last week, you know, when everything kind of went down um, and there were comments like, you know, people have been bullied in school, you know, people have been... Um, you know, and on sports fields, things have been said. People's, uh, you know, go, going to certain places where they won't shake your hand and they'll shake everyone else's hand. A lot of things like that have happened, you know, to us um, when, you know, in, in, you know, and this is not by older people, it's people of the same age. So it's something that you do have to kind of uh, raise awareness with. Yeah, I mean, one thing I want to touch on today, because... Um, you know, since the whole BLM Black Lives movement's happened over the last two weeks, I've also become a lot more educated about it just by kind of being inspired really? to read up on these kind of things. Um, and I'm actually quite shocked at some of the things that I've learned as well. So one of the things that I just kind of came across in one of the memes or, you know, the photos was um, that if you're a black woman from, you know, black descent and yeah. you have uh, give birth in the UK, you're five times more likely to die during childbirth than someone from, you know, from a white background, which I think is absolutely shocking and mind blowing. Five times. Mm. That's a ridiculous figure. Um, and, you know, there are some reasons why that might be the case. You know, we just don't think you're taught in med school, you know, higher risk of preeclampsia, you know, certain things like that, um, or gestational diabetes as well. But it just can't be just genetic. It just yeah. can't be. And there are certain other things going on. And one of the reasons why I want to talk to you about it today is because um, it's, it's a cultural thing. It's a thing that, you know, all doctors, dentists, nurses, midwives, you know, HCAs, the whole medical profession needs to address and look at mm. because that cannot be a society, a fair society where that's happening. No. Um, and so, you know, simple, by reading a fact like that, it's, it's shocking. Um, and so I was trying to think, you know, what can we do to make that, you know, spread awareness for a start, educate everyone like myself, you know, I was the first to, I was shocked by reading that. Um, and the thing is, things like social media have been so useful in that scenario. Um, and it's just, 
and I was I was looking into kind of why the reasons this might be the case, and they were saying that certain things like communication um, between people uh, of different cultures needs to be improved, um, and the only way you can improve communication between different cultures is because if by first of all empathizing with them, understanding them. Um, yeah. and being more educated about their culture. I mean, you can't really resonate with somebody unless you understand and are aware of their culture. Yeah. Um, well, so, if you see the study that Zane's put down below, that's that's really shocking. Uh, dentists are more likely to extract teeth from an Afro-Caribbean patient versus a white patient. I mm-hmm. think that kind of comes down to the uh, the root. The, the, almost, it's almost the same thing in a different in a different presentation. And you can look around at you know consultant positions. How many people are going? How many are going to, you know, equally qualified, um, mm. but maybe one race versus another race. And how how is that kind of uh, being manifested in management positions and all kinds of in all all walks and all um, areas of society? Well, the next thing I want to like talk about was. Obviously, we all know about the, the the number of doctors and dentists, you know, healthcare workers from you know BAME who have been dying from COVID nineteen, mm. uh, and again, that's something that's pretty obvious that to people like us who are from that kind of background, but you people want to realise on the outside is because you know this tends to be the kind of people who are working the frontline jobs for a start. But the reason that so many are dying, there's so many factors associated with that which have never to be never been addressed. Mm. Um, and I think, you know, not, you know, it's all important for us all to just be educated, understand what's going on. You know, how can we make a difference in this short 60 year lifespan that we're all going to have? And you know, what can we do to make it better? Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I'm happy that it's come to light. I'm happy that, you know, people are trying to make a change. I think it's the best thing for society. Um, and it's just quite sad, really, as well, at the same time that it's all happening. Um, and I do think that, you know, as, as doctors, dentists, it's our responsibility as well to do something about it and uh, not just sit back and let it keep happening because we're the ones that will, you know, we're the ones that will have to deal with this. We're the ones that are, uh, are the ones that are in a position where we can do something about it as well. Yeah. I, th- I think it's a very difficult thing to, to, to breach, especially as people from BME backgrounds, um, mm-hmm we can only you know raise the awareness and whether people or not are going to change that's going to be very difficult um there was a study or even a video that i watched the other day where it was a class in the i think it was in the 70s and they videoed it and um the teacher she decided that actually today blue-eyed people are better than brown-eyed people and they did all the same segregationist tactics that were actually enforced you know with the bosses etc etc so it's like, oh, people who've got blue eyes get to have twice as long a break time. You get cookies and milk. Everyone else has to stay inside and sit silently. Stuff like mm-hmm. that. And they're saying, oh, blue-eyed people are more uh, intelligent, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And within 15 and 20 minutes of this lesson, mm-hmm. you could see the difference between the two groups. One group was up and at it, and the others were very, very depressed. And this was after 15 minutes. If you can imagine then a whole lifetime of that, ingrained within people and lifetimes upon lifetimes then it makes a big difference and that's something we're going to have to overcome somehow yeah i mean i 100 percent agree with you mm. um uh, and like i said you know we are we are the next generation that need to do something about it um and so it's the, you know the responsibility lies just as much on our shoulders as everybody else's um and so you know i think we're in a very privileged position so, you know if you are working you know, you, you know you're in a position where you can do something yeah. So I feel as though we have every single right and responsibility just to, to do something, whether, it, and like I said, it can be in different ways. It doesn't have to be, you know, one simply minute just, sorry. We've got one minute left. One minute left. So we'll just kind of wrap up. I know, I know this can, we could quite easily talk about this for a long time. Yeah, yeah, go for it. We'll go answer for it. kind of life. Dash's question. Um, I think I would start reading things kind of just trying to understand how, how it's come about and kind of trying to educate people that I know, whether that's by stories, et cetera, et cetera. I think that's a good way to start yeah perfect i mean i'll, I'll let you organize the time because it is your life so i'll leave you to it uh yeah i i think that's probably the best way to go about it guys if anyone has anything any comments to make then be sure to kind of uh, message either one of us and we'll see what we can do thank you sean for joining us i think it's been really no interesting worries. kind of talk we've done something a little bit different today uh and for those guys who are with us make sure you have a little look at the patreon uh, group which is kind of how you can support uh all the things that i'm doing on instagram 
uh, and hopefully start building a real interesting community of uh, like-minded people uh, who are in it for the same reasons. Perfect. And don't forget to follow. Don't ever forget with Lucas. <laughs> Make sure you give us a shout out and don't forget yeah. to follow. <laughs> awesome, guys. See you later. Take care. See you later.